Good evening. You know, astronomy is still one of the few sciences where amateurs can and do make valuable contributions. They have their own telescopes, their own observatories, and every clear night you see them out there making measurements, taking photographs, doing all kinds of things professionals don't want to do, haven't got time to do. This evening, we're going to go to some of these amateur observatories, beginning up in Northumberland with Dr. Chris North. This view of nighttime Britain seen from space shows the light polluted cities and the dark countryside. In this programme, we visit astronomers who are observing from both. We start our observatory tour in County Durham in the northeast of England. I've come to the little village of Chilton to find one of our best planetary images. Keith Johnson lives here with his wife Kath and he has an impressive oh, setup in his garden. Keith has a reflecting yeah. telescope, a nine inch Schmidt Cassegrain. He well remembers what got him started in astronomy. It was 1972 and power cuts opened up a whole new world to a young lad, hungry to see the stars. The first time I actually got the bug of astronomy um, was when I was 14 year old. Okay. At that time, the, the, there was uh, minor strikes. Right. And the power stations had to conserve uh, fuel. And so now and again, you'd get power cuts. I went over to call my friend who just lived over the road from me. And he said, come here, look through this. And I could just see him make out a bit of light in what turned out to be an eyepiece. And I, I looked through and it was Saturn. Wow. And the way I we explained it was, that's another world. You're looking at another world there. And it's the first time I'd actually looked at it. And that was it. It, was, it just got us. I, I think Saturn's one of the first things I, I saw through a telescope. And it's such a hook, because it looks so different through an yeah. eyepiece, because it goes from a small pinprick of light to this ringed world. Yes. It's marvellous. Yes. Keith likes to look at our planetary neighbours. Being relatively close and bright, the planets are ideal targets for astronomers in a light-polluted area. Mars is a fascinating world, with weather and seasons causing changes that can be visible through a modest telescope. Here is Certis Major, a dark volcanic plain created by a long extinct volcano. Another favourite is the gas giant Jupiter, with its ever-changing bands of clouds and famous Great Red Spot. Keith also has some fabulous moon images. This montage of the phases shows how it changes over the month. Even with binoculars, you can see the craters and dark larval plains. But with a telescope, you can see features such as the Apennine Mountains in remarkable detail. These ancient volcanoes, some as high as three miles, sit on the edge of the Mare Imbrium, a conspicuous lava field. The moon, an alien world which is so close, yet so far. The cold nights in County Durham are quite a challenge, but Keith has found a way of returning to his comfort zone. So, so Keith, you've got this telescope here, and I'm used to seeing telescopes on a tripod in, uh, mm -hmm. in people's back gardens, but this one's yeah. on a, a plinth. Yeah, um, basically what it was, I wanted to uh, make life easier for myself. Around about four o'clock in the morning, when it's a bit of cold and you're tired, the thought of yeah. having to put everything away again, and it was just, oh, it's just something you just don't want to do, which is why a lot of people have observatories. Because of the light pollution in the area, and there's not a lot of space, I thought, wait, it's not going to be practical to build an observatory. I thought, the next best thing I can do is have a sort of pedestal and have the cables running outside from the, the conservatory. On a bit of cold night, you'd be lucky if you can stand 10 minutes before the cold's <laughs> biting through you. But in there, where it's nice and warm, you're there for as long as you want to be, as long as it's clear. Keith also likes to look at things outside our solar system. The Orion Nebula is an immense cloud of dust and gas around 1,500 light years away. But its immense distance means that long exposure photographs are needed to capture the intricate detail. Such faint objects can be washed out by light pollution, but Keith has found that a friendly word with the council helps matters along. I can't help noticing there's a couple of street lamps right outside your house. Do they interfere with your observing? They do, but not as not as bad as what it used to be. Right, OK. How, um, did, you, how did you solve the problem? Well, the first thing I did, I actually got in touch with the county council. And what they, they implemented is, throughout the northeast, as a cost-cutting exercise as well, is to uh, have full cut-off lights which are right. uh, the cheaper to run. The light is beamed straight down is where the light's so supposed to be. none of it goes up into the sky. Exactly. Yeah. 
yeah. anyway they came out and uh, they had a look and they tilted the lights they t turned the lights away so it's not perfect but it's a lot better than what it actually was in the battle against light pollution keith has shown that perseverance pays off and his magnificent images are proof that even in urban areas you can do some amazing things we're staying in the northeast of England, where there certainly seems to be a cluster of superb astrophotographers. It's now on to our next astronomer, who lives in the city of Durham. Well, here we are to see Jörg, and uh, this is the chap you know, isn't it? Well, Paul and I have come to visit Dr Jürgen Schmoll. So, yes. He's an amazing chap. He's very technical and grinds his own mirrors. Oh. During the day, Jürgen builds astronomical instruments for large telescopes, such as the VLT, but the night is all his. Jürgen has a vast collection of telescopes, some like this Ritchie Crichton, which he has bought and adapted, but many he has built himself, like this Newtonian reflector. And from his backyard, he takes amazing images of just about everything you can think of astronomically. I am really keen to see his setup. I can see telescopes. Oh, oh wow, wow look, look at this. That's amazing, Jürgen originally came from Germany, but he settled here and loves the north of England. Oh, Jürgen. Oh, hi, Pete and Paul. Hello, hi, nice to see you. Nice yes. to meet you. Yes. And what are you doing up here in the frozen waste <laughs> of the north? <laughs> yes, observing. Yeah. I didn't bring any telescope with me when I came. I thought, right. oh, I'm only for two years, and it's always raining in England. So <laughs> You've noticed. <laughs> yeah, first thing, first thing I came, there was a spell of clear sky. Jupiter was grinning at me and had no scope. Well, what about this telescope, Jürgen? Because it looks very large and uh, brand new. Well, what type yeah. of telescope is this? Yeah, it is indeed brand new. I just got it a few weeks ago. Won't touch it's, it actually, <laughs> yeah, it's actually a Ritchie Crichton telescope, right. which is named after two opticians who developed this in 1928. Mm. Right. And lots of professional telescopes are built like this. They're quite good. I got a bit addicted to the high image scale. Isn't Ritchie yes. Crichton the same um, technology used for the Hubble? Yes, it is. It is yes. It's the same so you have your technique. own little Hubble. Yeah. Yes, little yeah, Hubble. Yes, yeah. yeah, you can say so, yes. <laughs> Jürgen has so many wonderful images, it's hard to choose some favourites, but his star clusters are particularly nice. Some are new objects with stars that have formed together, such as the Pleiades or Messier 45, or the double cluster in Perseus. <laughs> what kind of astronomy are you into then? Mostly uh, deep sky astrophotography. Right. Okay. Do you have any mm. favourite objects that you like to image from? Yeah, for example, the Andromeda Nebula. I got a bit addicted to an object called NGC 206 in the Andromeda galaxy. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Star cloud area, isn't yes. it, on one edge of it, yeah. I like Jürgen's comets, such as Comet Garrard. Small, dirty snowballs tumbling through space. As they near the sun, the surface evaporates, creating a halo and characteristic tail. In 2007, Comet Holmes graced our skies and underwent a massive outburst, which unbelievably created a halo bigger than the sun. Jürgen keeps alive an old tradition in astronomy, making your own telescopes. Jürgen's first telescope took him two years to make, but he has it down to a fine art. His record is making an 8-inch mirror in just 21 days. Impressive stuff. It's the feeling, once you put a telescope together with your, mm. your self-made optics and you put it together, look at a planet or something and you see it in full glory and you yes. realise it's, it's your optics. It is. Yeah. Feelings I shall never have. You shall. Well, maybe one day. Maybe one day. Jürgen, thank you very yes, much. thank you, Jürgen. Oh, you're welcome. Mm -hmm. Back garden observatories are the backbone of astronomy. Over the years, the sky at night has visited a few, so it's back to Patrick for something special from the archives. In 1970, I went to see another of our very well-known amateurs, Dr. Frank Ackfield. He has his observatory, and uh, here is a clip. Good evening. Well, as you can see, I'm not in a BBC studio. I am, in fact, at Newcastle on Tyne, at Frank Ackfield's observatory at Forest Hall. And we are delighted to have Frank with us for this evening's sky at night. This very neat and efficient looking dome contains a 10 inch reflecting telescope. And just to make sure that we all know where we are, the latitude and longitude is given on the door. Frank's dome and telescope were all built by his friends just after the war. In those days, enthusiasts made everything by hand, from the mirror to the telescope mount. This reflector was made for me by Mr Tom Whitton of Newcastle, and he came to me and said, 
he didn't like the mounting I had, it didn't fit the lovely observatory, would I allow him to make a mounting equal to the uh, beautiful building in which it was housed? Astronomy today uses digital cameras and webcams. Back in the 1970s, Frank used photographic plates, which were extremely delicate and had to be developed by hand. I think you're very wise, too, in doing your developing and processing actually on the spot. Yes, this is my darkroom, Patrick, and uh, what I do is this. I have my developer and my hypo here. Then I put my plate into the developer and I'm able to rock the dishes. Once this is done, I can remove them, wash the plates, and then transfer them into the enlarger here. Then if you have a picture like this, say, and wish to enlarge it, then simply by moving this height up here, then you can enlarge from a picture like this to a picture the size of the table. This is one of Frank's pictures of the full moon, taken with the 10-inch reflector, of course. Frank contributed a great deal to astronomy, although nothing now remains of his observatory. But it was the tireless work of dedicated amateurs like Frank which inspired today's generation of astronomers. Next in our observatory tour, we're going to Hexham and the light-pollution-free rural countryside of Northumberland. I've come to visit amateur astronomer Peter Vasey. From his back garden, Peter looks over the Pennines and has a wonderful view of the southern horizon. Quite simply, an astronomer's paradise. Peter has an 8-inch reflecting telescope and takes all sorts of wonderful images, not only of the popular Messier objects, but also some more obscure targets. Have you ever seen anything as perfect as the soap bubble nebula? So, Peter, here we are in rural Northumberland. It's a lovely area, and at the yeah. moment we've got beautiful sunshine. Is that a common occurrence up here? Or? Well, it does happen occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, I'm... of course, nighttime is what I really came here for. The dark skies and clear southern horizon, combined with his little observatory tucked away behind the bushes, allow Peter to take pictures of some of the most beautiful objects that grace our night skies. Here is the Lagoon Nebula, a fabulous sea of gas which contains a vast array of astronomical objects. More distant still, galaxies are a particular favourite of Peter's. The light has come from such a long way away. Those photons have travelled for millions of years to get here and either end up their journey on, the, on your retina, if you're mm -hmm. doing it visually, seeing a little faint grey blob in your telescope, yeah. or of course on the, on the camera chip or film, um, where you can integrate, integrate it over a long period and pick out all the wonderful complexity and intricacy of these marvellous things. Peter is fortunate to live in such a dark location, but some astronomers manage to successfully observe from the light-polluted cities. It's the last of our observatories and time to leave the northeast and come down to Southampton. I'm here to meet Dr Lillian Hobbs, who has a very interesting setup in her back garden. Dr Lillian Hobbs' first passion is astronomy. And her second passion is motorbikes, touring the world seeing spectacular locations. Lillian has two observatories. The largest one houses her refractor, where she does most of her astronomical imaging. And like some of our other astronomers, she has taken some fabulous images of the galaxies. I take her journey down to the bottom of her garden, where Lillian keeps her observatories. Hello, Lillian. Hello, Paul. Two telescope domes. I'm very impressed. Paul, this is just a small dome. Let me show you my larger oh, dome. Oh, yes, please. I am very go. impressed. <laughs> And just a little bit envious. This is where all the action happens, in here. Oh, this is where I lose my head. Oh. Well, Lillian, thanks for inviting us to one of two magnificent observatories you have here. Uh, why don't you tell us what got you into astronomy? Well, I first got into astronomy um, during the Apollo era. Ah. I remember watching the Apollo landings, and my brother also had a great interest in astronomy as well. So as soon as I was old enough, I joined my local astronomy club and used to dream of owning a really nice telescope. Yes. Uh, and so that was really how it started. And what was your first telescope? My first telescope was a nice three-inch refractor. Uh, and I just used to go out, look at the moon. Um, I did take my camera. 
And I've still got a paperweight with my first photograph of the moon that I took. Good Lord. First photo... I've never even managed to take a photograph of the moon, so you've got one up on me. Well, I think it's fair to say you've upgraded since um, then. Just upgraded just a little bit over the year. Then you've got hold of this one. This is a fine telescope. This is a 7-inch refractor. Um, no, I must confess, there were a few more telescopes before oh, this good one. Lord. So I worked my way up, really, over the years. Lillian loves galaxies. You can see them in binoculars, but with Lillian's telescope, they look magnificent. The many billions of stars are resolved beautifully. This is M51, or the Whirlpool Galaxy, which is in the constellation of Cannes Venetici, or the Hunting Dogs. These are two galaxies caught in a gravitational embrace. The serene beauty conceals the fact that the smaller galaxy is being ripped apart. Who knows? Perhaps in one of the stars in one of these galaxies, there may be a planet with an astronomer looking back at us. Is this your main observatory then? This is my main observatory. So this is an eight foot fiberglass dome. It's quite sturdy. It's, yeah, it's very sturdy. It's survived a few storms. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in here, what do you mostly do? Well, in here, what I like to do is I like to take photographs. Right. All right, just n nothing serious, although I've got some very serious kit, yeah. but it's just <laughs> for fun. I'd love to image sort of galaxies, nebulas, things like that. So one of my real favourites is um, the Horsehead Nebula. Oh, yes. That, that's very hard to pick up visually. It's very hard to pick up visually. In fact, even here with the scope, um, I find that I get a very faint image after about a minute. So I know that I'm in the right vicinity. And then it'll take me about an hour to image the horse head. Well, apart from the horse head? The Flame Nebula as well. I like to do that with my small refractor because it's nice and wide field and I can capture that in. The Flame and Horsehead Nebula in Orion is made of dense gas and dust, which is lit by the new stars forming within it. The Horsehead's shape is an optical effect and is just a patch where the dust is so dense no starlight can be seen. Spotting shapes in space can become an astronomical pastime. Lillian's image of the Pelican Nebula is jaw-dropping. This is the Veil Nebula and to the left is the Witch's Broom. Simply magical. So what about some of the objects? Uh, so we have in sort of Sagittarius, we have a lot of uh, interesting deep sky objects like globular clusters. Do you do anything with well, that? I, I do, I do. One of the problems I do have is anything that's a bit low, because sometimes the garden might need a bit of trimming. Right. And it's often called the Sagittarius cut if I want to get something <laughs> that's really low. Um, middle of the night? Middle of the night, yeah. yes. Get, <laughs> get the old head torch out and trim the bushes off a little bit because it's in the way. I can imagine. Um, but I have gone after some of the galaxies in Leo for example, in fact, actually that's a good fun thing to do, I find, is to do the wide field oh, and course, just yeah. see how many of those galaxies I can pick up. Yeah, the, I mean the Vertigo cluster, for example, you are many, many galaxies yes. in there. I love seeing uh, those long exposure photographs, so the, sort of the whole field is just full of galaxies. It's just full of them. Have you managed to count how many you've been able to pick up? Um, no, because I keep losing track, actually. Oh, good Lord. Well, Lillian, thank you for inviting us to your observatory. You're it's very been a welcome. real pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Although we have seen some amazing telescopes, you can enjoy looking at the night sky with a Mark I eyeballs or a pair of binoculars. Here is some advice Patrick gave back in 1970 about how to get started in astronomy. It's as relevant today as it was back then. You know, I'm asked many times every week how one starts taking up astronomy as a hobby. And I always give the same answer. You don't, in fact, need any optical equipment whatsoever, and you certainly don't need a large and expensive telescope. The very first step is to buy a star map, which only costs a shilling or two, and then go out and learn your way around the sky. Learn your constellations. It's this good advice that got so many of us started in astronomy. Thank you, Patrick. There is so much the amateur can do. And I believe astronomy is the best of all amateur hobbies. Now next month, back to Mars. The probe, curiosity, will have landed by then, and we're looking forward to seeing what it has to tell us. So until then, good night.